Hello everyone everywhere, Pastor Robert Thibodeau here. Welcome to Freedom Through Faith. Glory to God, we're so blessed you're joining us today. It's a blessing every time we gather together around the Word of God and just share the gospel around the world through the power of the internet. Praise God for this technology that he provided us today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. We'll go ahead and get started in today's Bible study. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. We come before your throne this day of grace and mercy, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this technology that makes it possible to share your word around the world through the power of the internet. Father, we thank you that someone somewhere this day would receive Jesus as their Savior as a result of this broadcast. And to you, sir, we give all honor, glory, and praise for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Join me in our profession of faith, commonly referred to as the Apostles' Creed. We do this each and every week, and it is so important that your own two ears hear your own voice. Say these words out loud, for again, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Amen. Just repeat after me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who is crucified, dead, and buried. Oh. He descended into hell. But the third day he rose again from the dead. Praise God. He ascended up into heaven and is seated now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he is about to return to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe the church is the body of Christ. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And I believe in life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Glory to God. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Hallelujah. Praise God. And we have been studying these past couple of weeks on the blood covenant. I believe this is week number four, but prior to that, we were studying the power of your words. Taken together, these two studies are encompassing what I believe to be the most important parts of walking by faith and not by sight. Now, now the writer of Hebrews is saying very much the same thing. He's not a Greek philosopher. He is speaking about the revelation of God, but he's speaking in a, a very real sense because the Greeks weren't too far off. Amen? There is a real world. This world we live in, folks, this world right here, all this physical, is not the real world. In terms of God's revelation of the Old Covenant, it, this is just shadows and types and pictures and reflections, all from the pattern up in heaven. Amen? The earthly temple, that earthly tabernacle, is a place it's a place that's only a copy of the real temple of God. Earthly worship is only a, just a remote reflection of what real, true worship will be when we get to heaven. Amen? The earthly priesthood right now is only an inadequate shadow of the real priesthood. In fact, if you go back to Exodus 25, verse 40, you'll find that when Moses received the instructions about building the tabernacle and all of its furnishings, God said to him, look that you make them after their pattern, which was shown to you in the mountain. That pattern is a heavenly pattern. All the earthly things are just pictures of the pattern. And you, can deceive, you can discern things here, but until you actually get to heaven... You can't enjoy them. Why? Well, for example, in the military. 
This, this is a good example. At least in my mind, it is. Praise God. I hope you get it. But I learned how to read topographic maps. If you don't know what that is, it's the line, you know, that depicts the terrain features with all the squiggly lines on it, right? I learned how to read those maps. I could study that map and I would know exactly where we needed to go the route that I would take to get there, the terrain that I would have to cross, and what I would be looking for once I arrived at my destination. And as I was leading our patrol to the destination, I would observe like a cliff face or some other terrain feature on the map, look up, and say, there it is, right, in the natural. I knew exactly where I was on that map. This is, and folks, this is way before GPS, okay? But it was only after I arrived at my destination that I could actually view what I was supposed to be looking at in the natural and then take it all in. That's how it is with us in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. We can study the pattern, but we will not be able to actually experience it until we get there. Now, last time as we were finishing up, uh, Jesus was being seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And that signifies two things. One, he had finished his work. And two, he was being honored by God. Amen? That means Jesus is superior to Aaron. Number one, because he's seated. Number two, because he serves in a superior sanctuary, not pitched by men, but pitched by God. He serves in the real sanctuary. There, there's a tremendous truth right there, folks. You should shout amen right there. I mean, matter of fact, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. Praise God. Here in Hebrews, he begins to pursue his argument from the general to the particular. Now, I want you to stay with me now because there's some great things here. It says here, now, of the things which we've spoken is a sum. We have such a high priest that he is appointed to sit at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. How can I say this? There is going to be some great things here as he begins to pursue his argument in Hebrews chapter 8, from the general to the specific. Okay, let's say this because, you know, for every high priest is appointed, look at this, every high priest, verse 3, is ordained or appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. So the question would come up at this point, well, if, if he's finished his work and he's up there in heaven, what's he got to do? Is he just sitting there waiting for God to say, oh, Jesus, it's, today's the day. You got to go get everybody. No, no, that's not how it works. Okay. I'm trying to take my time on this. I know where I want to go, but I got to build this step by step for you. Every high priest, every high priest is appointed to be ministering, right? If he is a legitimate high priest, he's going to be busy. He'll be ministering in the area of gifts and sacrifices. And it says here, Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man has someone, somewhat also to offer. If it is a standard commodity for priests to do it, then he'll be doing it because he's the perfect high priest. You see... A Jewish person, especially one learned in the scriptures at this point, would say, well, then that's not a priest at all. You don't have any priest there because he may be just up there sitting down. He's sitting around. He hasn't got anything to do. There's no ministry up there. So really, he's not a true priest. So here the Hebrew writer says, every high priest, every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this man do it as well. So did Jesus offer a sacrifice? Yes, he did. He offered the sacrifice of himself. But notice the term gifts. If we go to chapter 5 and uh, verse 1, 
Every high priest taken from men, among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. That he may offer gifts and sacrifices. And the gifts idea is simply divides sacrifices into two kinds that are in Scripture. Remember, two kinds of sacrifices. The first kind of sacrifice that you study in the Old Testament is the meal offering, right? In the meal offering, there wasn't any blood shed at all. You merely brought the meal offering as it was. The other kind of sacrifices involve blood, and that's the distinction right here. He is simply saying every high priest is involved with both kinds of offerings. The bloodless meal offering, gifts, and blood offerings, sacrifices for sin. So Jesus, if he is a true high priest, will be doing both of these things. And you may say, well, I understand he did the first, the sacrifice of blood, when he offered his own blood on the mercy seat, when he offered himself as a sacrifice. But what about the gifts, Brother Bob? Is he still ministering in the area of gifts? And if so, what are they? Well, let me take that for a moment and explain it to you. In the Old Testament, all of the meal offerings had to do with thanksgiving and dedication. When a man brought a meal offering, he was thanking God and dedicating his life to God. It was an act of dedication. It was not for the atonement of sin. It was a personal dedication, a personal commitment, personal thanksgiving for what God had blessed him with. And what he's doing is praising God and thanking God and acknowledging God in his life and committing himself to live for God. That's what those sacrifices of those offerings were, were for, right? Uh, let's take, for example, uh, the, the harvest of first fruits. You know, they've planted their fields. They're watching them grow. And now the harvest is starting to come in. And the first fruits from that harvest, they took back and offered it to the temple to offer it to God thanking God for the bountiful harvest that they are about to receive. Have they received it yet? No. This is just the first fruit from the, you know, we usually have tomatoes out in our garden, and you're watching the tomatoes. They're starting to ripen, and that first tomato, do we just dig everything up now and say, okay, we're done? No. That first tomato that's taken from that, that tree, that vine, is just a symbol of what's about to happen because all of them are going to get ripe. Amen? And that's what the Jews are doing here. They're taking the first fruit that is ready for harvest and bringing it to God, thanking him for what the blessing is about to be. Amen? So that's what you need to understand here. It's a personal dedication, thanking him and acknowledging God in his life. And those are the sacrifices of offerings and how they're meant to be. So we see Jesus is continuing to do this for us, for none of us. Now, watch, watch it here. Listen to me now. None of us can praise God. None of us can dedicate ourselves to God. None of us can truly worship God. None of us can truly thank God unless we do it through whom? Through Jesus Christ. We always come to God by him, don't we? Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Oh, amen. You know, now, people, a lot of people, believers in particular, just think about that in the salvation aspect. But the same thing holds true for the praising aspect. No one gets to the Father but through Jesus to praise him for the blessings. So in a sense, Christ continues even right now to minister our gifts to God. He is ministering our gifts to the Father. And as we bring the thanks and the praise and the worship of our hearts and the dedication of our lives and present them to God, Jesus takes those gifts 
gifts of our thanks, gifts of our praise, gifts of our worship, gifts of our dedication, and he is the one who takes them and offers them to God. So he is still ministering for us in the area of gifts of our dedication and offers them to the Father. He is still ministering in the area of gifts. He is no longer just ministering alone in the area of sacrifice. He only needed to do that. He only needed to minister in our behalf one time. Amen? One time. That was it. So he says in effect in verse 3 that Jesus is a legitimate high priest who is ministering. In verse 4, he goes on to talk about the fact that he is a heavenly priest. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Now, why wouldn't Jesus have been a priest? Huh? Why wouldn't Christ have been a priest if he was an earthly priest? Even if he wanted to be an earthly priest, he couldn't do it. What's the one thing that would have withheld him from the priesthood? He was from the wrong tribe, wasn't he? He could not qualify to be a priest because he was not born from the tribe of Levi. Therefore, he was disqualified from the earthly priesthood. So he simply says, and the Jew may have said this at this point in his mind, well, if he's a priest, then what's he doing up there? Why doesn't he come down here where we need him? He can't be on earth ministering. Seeing there are priests here that offer gifts according to the law. In other words, God has set in a, a certain, we'll call it a ceremonial law in place. A ceremonial law that's in motion. That ceremonial priesthood is what's on earth. God does not need other priests to do what the ceremonial priesthood does. It's interesting that God never confuses substance and shadow. He never mixes the two. Jesus cannot be an earthly priest because of the very fact he's from the wrong tribe. So he must minister somewhere else. And that's the point. He does minister somewhere else. In a better place, praise God, which makes his priesthood a better priesthood. Hallelujah. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Glory to God. Let's look at verse 5. He goes on to talk about the priests who serve as an example and shadow of the heavenly things. Those priests in verse 4 who offer gifts according to the law are examples and a shadow of the heavenly thing. Exodus 25 says, As Moses was admonished by God when he was about to make the tabernacle, he said, See, he said, that you make all things according to the pattern showing you in the mountain. In other words, even Moses must have known this was not the real thing. This is just a shadow, a representation, because he saw the true one in heaven. So Christ must be a priest of a superior sanctuary. He cannot be one in the earthly priesthood, he's in the wrong tribe. There doesn't need to be any confusion here because they are already there are already earthly priests doing earthly ministry, doing what they've been set up to do, but they are only the examples. They are only the shadows of the heavenly priesthood and the heavenly people, the heavenly holy place, the heavenly temple. Praise God. The heavenly temple was first. It was a pattern on which the earthly temple was made after. And the Jews always thought that the Aaronic priesthood was the first priesthood. No, it wasn't. Not so. It was only a pattern of the true priesthood which already existed in heaven before the Aaronic priesthood even existed started. Oh, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Praise God. Hallelujah. The word example, when you break it down to its root word, means sketch or outline or copy. It's translated figure in chapter 9 verse 24. This was only a copy of the real thing. 
This whole economy, the whole system of priests in the Old Testament was only a copy. Think about our financial system here in the United States and for that matter around the world. At one point in time, it was all based on gold. Every dollar you spent was based on gold. Back when I was young, you could take your money into the bank and say, I want some gold. And they give it to you. Or you could go out and if you found gold, you could take it to the bank. They'd weigh it and give you money. All right? But then, 19, I believe, 72, 73, President Nixon took us off the gold standard because they wanted to start running up a deficit. Prior to then, every dollar bill issued had to be backed by that weight in gold. Now they just print paper with nothing to back it up except their promise. Oh, yeah, someday we'll pay you. We'll pay it off someday. No. Today, the government says, oh, we need more money. Just print it. There's nothing backing it. Heaven's not like that. Everything that we are ministering here in the temple and in the churches and in the ministries here is backed by God. There's a pattern in the heavenlies. Right? This whole economy, the whole system of priests in the Old Testament is like that. It's just a copy. The second word is a great word. It's, what's the word? Shadow. The word for shadow is broken as skia. It says exactly what it means. It's a shadow or a silhouette. Did you, I hope you realize this, did you know or realize that a shadow has no independent substance at all? No independent existence of its own? It has no existence at all. The shadow exists only as proof of the fact that there is a reality somewhere else. Am I right? Think about this now. When you see a shadow, if you are outside and then a shadow approaches you on the ground, what do you do? You turn around and see who's come up to you, right? Because you, your mind says, oh, something just made a shadow. The shadow has no independent existence at all. You see the shadow, well, you can't reach down and grab it. There's nothing there. And it's the same way with the Aaronic priesthood. It has no independent existence in itself. It is merely a shadow of the real thing, which is heavenly. And let me add here a little analogy. What causes a shadow? Something standing between you and the light that's shining on you. Think about it. Am I right? You see the shadow of someone standing between you and the sun. You see the shadow of a tree planted between you and the sun. You see the shadow of the house that's between you and the sun. If the Aaronic priesthood is the shadow... It must be because there is something between them and the light shining on them. Now, God is that light. Jesus is the light of the world. So if Jesus is the true high priest and God's light is shining down from heaven, the Aaronic priesthood is the shadow of Jesus. Not the real Jesus. It's just his shadow. I, ho I hope that didn't confuse you. I hope that gives you... Uh, an example of what we're talking about here. And so, simply stated, Jesus is a better high priest because he has a superior sanctuary, one in heaven, which is the real one, not the copy. And as well, he is now seated, which no high priest ever, ever, ever thought about doing. For the earthly priesthood, that work was never finished. Then he moves in verse 6 to make a transition to his final point. It says, but now he's obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much more also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Praise God. What's he saying here? Let's just take the first part. Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. That's a tremendous statement. That's like the highlight, right? He's a better priest all the way down the line. Every aspect, he's a better priest. He is seated. He is in the true sanctuary, 
the sanctuary of heaven. Therefore, he has obtained a more excellent ministry. So what is this saying? This is saying to the Jew, why would you fool around in the shadows when you can come to the reality? Why play in the shadows when you can come to the light? Do you see it? That's what he's saying to the reader. Why do you want to dwaddle away in those things that are only copies and pale reflections when you can come to the truth in Jesus the Messiah? And you can have a priest who's in the holy of holies in heaven, not just in the shadows down here. This is a tremendous message to the Jews as well as to us. Amen. Then in verse 6, he says, making his transition complete now, he says, He's also the mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. If he's superior, if his sanctuary is superior, then his covenant is superior. And that's the point that I'm trying to get to today. He is superior because of his seat, because of his sanctuary, because of his superior covenant. And that we see in, in verses, really, verse 6 through 13. This is primarily a quote from the book of Jeremiah. Now, we're not going to study it in detail, but let, let's just briefly go over it. Verse 6, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. That's a tremendous concept just in that word mediator. We know the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, we have one mediator between God and man. That man, Jesus Christ. The word used here for mediator is an interesting word as well. It's called, it's spelled, and my Greek's not great, but it's spelled M-E-S-I-T-E-S, -E mesites. And it's from the Greek word meseos, which means in the middle. The mediator is the one who stands in the middle of two and brings them together. Right? Isn't that what a mediator does here? Mediator takes two sides who are opposing each other and tries to find that common ground where they can come together. Galatians chapter 3, verse, one nine, verse 19, Paul uses the word mesites to speak of Moses. He says, Moses is the mesites of the old covenant. What does that mean? He's the one who brought God and man together under the old system. Here the writer says, Jesus is is the perfect mesites, or mediator, of a better covenant. All that Moses couldn't do because of human weakness, Jesus does. He brings God and men together perfectly, providing access where the old priesthood could never do that. That veil was in place. This covenant is a better covenant. Because he is a better priest, a better high priest, amen? And it's also better, look at the end of verse 6, because it's established on better what? Promises. Now all covenants were made on the basis of promises. God would promise to do something. That's what a covenant is. And what the promises are of the better covenant are clearly outlined verses 8 to 12. Because that's a direct quote, a direct quote, a direct quote. Let me say it one more time so you get this. Verses 8 to 12 is a direct quote out of Jeremiah verse thirty-one, chapter 31, verse 31, and the following verses. And we're going to look at this as we go. But it's based on better promises. The whole new covenant is better. Praise God. Look at verse 7, and we'll get to the better promises in verse 8. Verse 7, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there would not be any need for a second. That's the point. If I was an unbelieving Jew, I would say, that's right. You're exactly right. So why are you giving us all this baloney about a second covenant? Why are you doing this? Are you saying the first one's got faults and has problems? What gives you the right to say that? What gives you the right to tell me there needs to be another covenant? What gives you the right to say the first one had a lot of faults and that's why another one's come along? Who says so? So the writer of Hebrews answers and says right here, God says, through Jeremiah, your own prophet. Zap, right? Hey, man, don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Verse 8 says, 
for finding fault with them, he said. Who said it? God said through Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Oh, that's in Jeremiah? Yeah, that's right. But notice, Mr. Jewish expert, your own word says to you the old covenant has problems and that God has to get another one. And you know, there are Jews today who are hanging on tenaciously to the old covenant. They despise the truth that has been preached about the new covenant. They detest the truth. They're not willing to acknowledge that it is their own book. Their own beloved and dear prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who said, something's wrong with this one. So God's going to give a new one. He's going to write a new covenant. And guess what? He did in Christ Jesus. Amen. The first covenant was not faultless. It was weak where? In the flesh. It was spot on, 100% correct, but nobody could live by it. Galatians 3, verse 21. It was excellent for what it was meant to do, which was to point men to the coming of Christ, but it could not bring them to God. It was simply the sign, the type and shadow of the heavenly covenant. It wasn't the train that got them there, Paul said to the Galatians, that the law was our taskmaster, our schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. They needed to be a better covenant. And the Jew says, who says that? And so the writer here in Hebrews says, God says by Jeremiah, your beloved prophet. God prophesied in his own words. Jeremiah quotes God directly in verse 8. It says, for he says, God said it, Jeremiah wrote it down, I will make a new covenant. Amen. Now, from there, Jeremiah launches in the very words of God. God's doing the speaking here. God tells us how the new one is better. It has its distinctions. They're not always different from the first, but put together, they make it different. Let's just begin with the first one. What's the first feature of the new covenant? God is the author. That's the first feature. Finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is coming, say the Lord, when I, God, said, I will make a new covenant. God's the author of it. Now, the word for covenant is fascinating. Again, my Greek may not be perfect, but I'm going to give you the idea. Diaphasi. Now, diaphasi is not too fascinating just to say it, but when we get to it, you'll see. The normal Greek word, anytime you made an arrangement with anybody, normal Greek word was sunfesi, sun meaning with, on an equal basis. Normally, in any kind of agreement, a contract, sunfesi would be the correct word. It is the word for a marriage covenant. It was the word for all ordinary contracts between two people on an equal level, you know, like buying or selling or trading something. Diaphasis, not used, is not used for an argument like that. Diaphasis was reserved only for wills, for making a will. Why? You know, you, you may ask, well, why does the Spirit choose diaphasis when it says the Lord will make a new covenant? The reason is this. Sun facing describes an agreement made by two equal partners. God at no time considers himself equal with men. God does not make equal covenants with men. God and man, now watch this now. This is critical. You need to understand this. God and man never enter agreements on equal terms. God doesn't come to us and say, look, here's my terms. And then man turns around and says, no, 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 no. Here's my terms. And then they start negotiating and, you know, I'll give up a little bit, you give up a little bit, and everybody will be happy. No, it does not work like that. Sorry to break your, your bubble there. You can never, and I, let me say that again, you can never, at no time, in no way, under any circumstances, bargain with God. It's just not possible. You can never argue the terms of God's covenant. 
You can never say, well, now look, God, listen to me now. God, listen to me now. If you'll give up a little bit here, then I'll adjust my life a little bit over here. No, you cannot do that. It does not work that way. God makes the covenant. You can only accept it or reject it. You don't change it. Amen? Now, the best illustration of this is a will. And that's why the aphasia is reserved for only use in a will. A will is not made on equal terms, is it? Not at all. It is made by one person, and the other person either accepts it or doesn't want to partake in it. You don't have anything to say about adjusting it. You can't bargain with a will. That's why the word is the aphasia. Our relationship to God is based solely on God's terms, never on our terms, God's terms. He's the author, and that's why I say the first feature of the new covenant is, remember, it's God who wrote the new covenant. Now, people can come along and say, well, I don't see how God could do that. What about over here? You know, this person believes this way. And what about all the people in China? What about all the people who never heard about God? Oh, I mean, you know, God's to, you know, he's, he's got to be willing to take all these people into account. No, he doesn't. That's your job to go tell him. God makes his covenant on his terms. A man either takes it as is or rejects it. There's no arguing with God, no negotiating with God. In the first place, God knows exactly what is right, exactly what is best. And any concession God made would be to an area which was wrong. So that's not going to happen. So first of all, God is the author of the new covenant. Second thing about the new covenant, it's different. It's different than the old. It's not just an attachment to the old covenant. It's not just, you know, in the United States, we can amend the Constitution. God doesn't amend the covenant. Nowhere you can see this in the word new, the new covenant. There are several words in Greek that's used for new. Neos, which means new in the sense of production, and kinos, which means new in the sense of quality. Now, let me use this as a an example. The difference between a new car and a new invention. You can say, oh, I have a new car, but it's not really new in the keenest sense of the word. It's new in the neos sense. That's where new came from. Because there's a lot of cars. Your car has four wheels. Your car has an engine. Your car has a steering wheel. Your car has a seat, just like all the other cars. So it's not new in the sense of a new invention. Okay, It's new in the sense of it was just produced. But if a guy came along and said, hey, I just invented a, a, a seven-wheel car with no steering wheel, and it floats on the air. You say, wow, that's new. That would be the word kinos. That means something that never existed prior to this but has now come into existence. And the new covenant is like that. It's new in kinos. It's a whole new thing. It's not just a little adaptation. It is a whole new thing. The new covenant is just like that. New. And you might as well let the old one go now because you got a new one that's even better. In fact, in verse 13 it says, Now that which decays and grows old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant vanishes away. It decays. It vanishes away. That's an interesting word, isn't it? It means to obliterate, to completely wipe out of existence. And that's what happens to the old covenant. It is totally wiped out. Jesus said, I have not come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. But now that it's been fulfilled, it no longer applies because now we have a new covenant. It is to The old covenant is totally wiped out. This is such an important message to the readers of Hebrews because they're hanging on to that old covenant tenaciously. Amen? So what do we learn about the new covenant? God's the author, and it's different. The third thing now, 
The new covenant, oh, this is going to step on some toes. The new covenant was made with Israel. Uh-oh. The new covenant is with the Jews. And this is what I meant when I said this morning, God never made a covenant with the Gentiles. None. And as far as I can see, he never will. The new covenant, folks, is not made with the church. Uh-oh. Yeah, I know a lot of pastors are getting their toes stepped on right now because they think the church replaced Israel. No, it did not. This covenant is made with the same people the old covenant was made with. It was made with Israel. The church has not and will not ever replace Israel, despite some doctrines that teach the contrary. You say, well, what are we doing then? Well, we are beneficiaries of the new covenant, just like Gentiles could have become beneficiaries of the old covenant. But notice it didn't say, I mean, folks, this could not be any clear. I will make a new covenant with the church. Is that what it says? No, it does not. It doesn't even mention the church. It says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, the amillennialists, those are people who don't believe in any kind of restoration of Israel. They'll come along and say, well, when the Jews executed Jesus, they forfeited everything. No, 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 they didn't. Not so. God said, I, who's doing the speaking? God. I will make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah. Period. That's both sections of Israel, right? You say, well, I thought the northern tribes got lost, Brother Bob. They may have gotten lost to men. But God knows exactly where they are. They may be lost to some people, and there may be a lot of weird explanations about who they are, where they're at, and you know, but they're not lost to God. God has made his covenant with his people. And that's an important note. Okay? You see, nowhere in Scripture do you read that God ever made a covenant with the Gentiles. In Romans chapter 9, it says. Who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, covenants between God and his people Israel? They say, well, Ravah, does, does that mean we're not blessed? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. God said to Abraham, in you or through you shall all of the nations of the world be what? Blessed. Genesis 12, right? Amen. When God established Israel. He made an, unconven an unconditional covenant with Abraham to bless his seed and to bless the whole world through his seed. God said, I'll not only bless you, Abraham, I'll bless the whole world through your descendants. That was an unconditional promise made by God. God didn't say, Abraham... If you will promise me to do this four times a day and then run over here and do it three more times every other day and then do this and then then I'll do this. No, he just said, I'm going to do this through you. And then God said, well, in order for them to receive this blessing, they'll have to follow my standards. So that's when God set up the Mosaic Covenant to go along with the Abrahamic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant gave them the morality that goes along with God's desire that they might experience the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. If you, the Mosaic covenant said, if you obey my laws, then you'll get the benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. But what happened? Israel kept breaking the Mosaic covenant. Thus, they kept forfeiting God's blessings. And they're still being forfeited today, aren't they? By breaking the Mosaic Covenant, by rejecting the fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant, who's in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You say, well, then did God cancel the Abrahamic Covenant? Did, did God just say, well, that's it, no more blessing for Israel? No, he can't do that. 
If God could cancel one of his promises, that means he could cancel any one of them at any time, which then puts us on some pretty thin ice, doesn't it? So God says, I know what I'll do. I'll just get a new one. I'll get a new covenant that'll be able to do what the old one couldn't do. So he got the new covenant, and it could do all that the old one could not do. And you know what the Bible says? Let me read you some thrilling, thrilling things here. God wants to bless men. He says, if they would only follow my standards, I'd bless them. But they blew it with the Mosaic Covenant, so they forfeited Abraham's blessing. So God gave a new covenant to his people. And when you come into the new covenant as a beneficiary, you're a Gentile, you can experience all that's in the new covenant as a beneficiary, even though it's made with Israel. Listen to what happens. Galatians 3 verse 7. Don't you know, therefore, that they who are of faith, the same are the sons of Abraham? So when you believe in that which Jesus has done, you become a spiritual son of Abraham. And then the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in you and in me when we accept the principles of the new covenant. And the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, unto Abraham saying, in you all nations shall be blessed. Listen now. So then they who are of faith, they are blessed with faithful Abraham. Praise God. Don't shut me down when I'm preaching good. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Hallelujah. The Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in Pastor Bob's life. Praise God. The Abrahamic covenant isn't some mystical, weird thing way out there somewhere. You may say, oh, I, 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 I've heard about that, but what does it mean? It just mean, it means God promises to bless us. And it's fulfilled only when we accept the new covenant. And that we become spiritual children of Abraham. And how do you do that? Verse 14. That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that's you and me, through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Shout amen, somebody. It's through Jesus himself that the Abrahamic blessing comes to us. Through the new covenant, in his blood. We receive all of the promised blessings of God. All of them. Not one is left out. Listen, all the way to the end of chapter 3. And if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. And then we are heirs according to the promise. Hallelujah. You know, I've been a, vi been a, uh, a beneficiary of the Abrahamic covenant, even though I'm not a Jew. Because by receiving Jesus, I receive the new covenant and I receive the promised blessings through Abraham. They've become mine. I'm not a Jew, but I am a child of Abraham by faith. Hallelujah. You say, well, when is Israel going to get on this? I mean, they're not making it in the Abrahamic coming as fast as these Gentiles are. You're 100% spot on. That's right. But they will. The day will come when they will. At what period of time does the Bible say Israel, all of Israel will get saved? During the tribulation. And then comes their kingdom. Romans 11, 26, 27 so, says, So all Israel shall be saved. All of it. Every bit of it. So their day is coming, praise God. So God's the author of the new covenant. It's different. It's made with the Jews. Quickly now, it will not be according to legalism as the old covenant was. Look at verse 9. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they would not continue in my covenant. So I regarded them not. Oh, that's pretty strong stuff there. God had a legalistic Mosaic covenant and he made it with them. He led them out of Egypt. He put them in their land. And they blew all of his standards. And he said, 
I regarded them not. That's the Mosaic statement or the Mosaic covenant. If you do this, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll just walk away. But God says, I'm going to make a new covenant and it's not going to be like the old one. That covenant of the law at Sinai was conditional. You obey, you get blessed. You don't obey, you don't get, you don't get nothing. Zero squat. And it just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all the time. There was no security, no clear conscience, no freedom from guilt if you did something wrong. But God says, it's not going to be that way anymore. I'm going to have a covenant different from that one. A covenant that not only forgives them, but listen to me now, it keeps them. See? So if they don't vacillate all the time, not based on legalism, based on faith alone through Christ Jesus. That's it. It's different. It's not like the one I made with their fathers. It's not like the Mosaic Sinai covenant I made after I got them out of Egypt. Remember, right after, right immediately after they came out of Egypt, he made that covenant with them on the mount. And then when they didn't obey it, he didn't regard them anymore. God doesn't do that for us. He says to us that he is permanently in our hearts, that we're secure in him. He does not leave us nor forsake us. Period. End of statement. So the new covenant, God's the author. It is different. It is made with the Jews. It's not legalism. Next, it is an internal covenant. I love this. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, Jesus said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and I will write them in their heart. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. So here, simply, is the promise of the new covenant. Everybody's going to know this truth. It's not going to be only for the elite, only for the well-educated. Every believer is going to have a resident truth teacher who will lead them into all the truth, and bring all things to their remembrance, even the Holy Spirit. He says, and no longer will they have to teach each other and say, know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is in the new covenant to have the personal knowledge of Jesus Christ who lives within us at all times. Then the Holy Spirit just hits the capstone of the new covenant. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I, what? Remember no more. The promise of the Old Testament is finally being fulfilled. The greatest feature, friends, of the new covenant is total one. 100% forgiveness of all our sins. Past, present, and future, praise God. What a glorious covenant this is. Everything the old one could not do, this one does. Amen. And then in a closing statement, he says, and that he says a new covenant. Therefore, he's made the first one old. It has passed away. By the very fact God said there is now a new covenant. Hallelujah. He just made that old one pass away. It's no longer in force. Hallelujah. Shout amen somebody somewhere. Hallelujah. If you've never entered into this new covenant, oh man, you're missing out. And as we studied, the only way to enter into this new covenant is through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And you can do that today. Remember, we studied this out. The only way you can enter into God's covenant is on God's terms. They are not open for negotiation. You either accept them as they are, and then you're accepted, or you can reject the terms, turn around, and walk away from your will and your inheritance forever. And you can face eternity on your own. And it'll end up being in the lake of fire with no remedy ever. It's this kind of Bible faith God's looking for. 
We need to keep in mind that faith in the blood of God's Son is the only way this covenant operates. Without that kind of faith, the new covenant in Christ's blood will not benefit you at all. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The covenant we have now with God is written in the blood of his own son. Just think about this for a minute as we get ready to close. Do you think if you had to write an agreement with another individual and you had to write it in the blood of your own child who had to die in order to establish that contract, do you think you would take it serious? How would you feel if the other party just laughed it off afterwards as if it was nothing? Didn't mean anything to them. How would that make you feel? You know, we just celebrated Veterans Day here in America. And I can give this illustration and then we'll close. Having served in the military for a good chunk of my life, I have a serious attitude when it comes to love of country. And those who disregard this country and disregard the sacrifices of our military men and women who have made the total sacrifice over the years, really. And I mean, I mean, this really gets under my skin. So much so that I have to be careful or I'll, let's just put it this way, forget that I'm a Christian. You know what I mean? That's how serious I take the blood of those that sacrificed it all for our country. Because I took the same oath I, that they did. I was willing to give all, my all, for my country. That's how much I love the United States of America. Amen? And when I see or when I hear people that disrespect our flag, disrespect our nation, disrespect our service men or women, I get filled with, let's just call it righteous anger. Well, that's a very weak example of how much more God views those who disrespect the blood of his son. So my question for you today is, how do you view the blood of Jesus Christ and the blood covenant that God the Father entered into through the blood of his son, Jesus, in order to sovereignly agree to forgive you your sins and give to you eternal life? If you discount it, you can reject this offer one more time. Maybe you'll have another opportunity to change your mind. Then again, maybe not. And if not, then this day will be replayed in your memory forever. That you discounted the blood covenant. You rejected it. You made the decision. You did it. God was ready. Jesus was ready. The Holy Spirit was ready. They were all ready to enter into this agreement for your benefit. But you are the one that said no. Or you can accept the provisions of this blood covenant. What are the provisions? Simply this. Romans 10, verse 9 through 10. Just repeat this simple prayer after me, folks. Father, I come to you this day to ask forgiveness of my sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my heart and take over my life. That I would be a child of the Most High God, heir of God, and joint heir with you of all the promises. Now, Lord, I praise you for this answered prayer. And I pray all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer today, email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org. And you know, we want to rejoice with you. Amen. We want to rejoice with you and, and just thank you and praise you for entering the body of Christ. Amen. And if you need your own Bible, just email me at brotherbob at ftfm.org and I'll mail you your own Bible. I'll even pay the postage on it, but it's got to be in the continental United States. That's all the time we have for today. Till next time, I pass it by, I remind you be blessed in all that you do.